Vertigo opens with a policeman and Detective Scotty Ferguson chasing a fugitive across the San Francisco roof. They jump between roofs and Scotty slips and falls. He grabs a gutter at the last minute to save himself. The policeman tries to help but falls to his death. Scotty is horrified. Scotty convalesces at Midge's apartment. Midge was a college girlfriend. She has a motherly affection towards him. Scotty has quit the police force because of his fear of heights. He tests his condition by standing on a step stool. His phobia overwhelms him and he faints. Scotty gets a call from Gavin Elster, an old college friend. Gavin wants to hire him to follow his wife. Not for the usual reasons, but because Gavin believes his wife is possessed by a spirit from the past. Scotty bluntly recommends a psychiatrist. Gavin wants Scotty to gather information on his wife's mental health. He is worried she may try to harm herself. Skeptical, Scotty turns down the job, but Gavin gets him to agree to at least see her before making a final decision. Scotty sees Elster's wife. He finds her beautiful. Infatuated, he decides to take the job. He follows Madeline around San Francisco. She goes to a florist shop and buys a bouquet of flowers. She visits the grave of a woman named Carlotta. She sits in a museum and stares at a painting of Carlotta. The bouquet she purchased is the same as the one in the painting. Her hairstyle is also the same as the painting. Madeline goes to a hotel where she has a rented room. Scotty questions the hotel receptionist and learns that the house once belonged to Carlotta. After further research, Scotty is disturbed that the possession story may be true. Scotty meets with Gavin and they discuss the case. Scotty follows Madeline to Golden Gate Bridge where she jumps into San Francisco Bay. Scotty jumps in the water and rescues her. He then takes her to his apartment where he undresses her and puts her into his bed. This is where Scotty breaks from responsible behavior. He is a trained police officer and he knows the right thing to do when someone attempts suicide. But he doesn't call emergency services or take her to an emergency room or even call her husband. He takes her back to his place, takes off all her clothes, and puts her in his bed. Some may find this titillating, others may find this creepy. Regardless, it is unstable, high-risk behavior. It's so extreme as to be comical. Madeline wakes up naked in the strange man's bed, and needless to say, she's a little startled. She then puts on Scotty's dressing gown, and they have coffee and a casual conversation. She is in a strange man's apartment naked under his dressing gown, flirting with him like it's a first date. The husband calls, concerned about his wife. Scotty reassures Gavin not to worry, he's taking care of things. While they talk, Madeline gets dressed and leaves. The next day, Scotty continues to follow Madeline. He follows her to his place. She is dropped by to say thank you. They have a warm, open conversation like old friends. They spend the day together. They kiss passionately. This man does not know the meaning of boundaries or self-control. Madeline tells Scotty about a horrible dream she had, where she is searching for something at an old Spanish mission. Scotty knows that she is describing a real place called San Juan Batista, where Carlotta lived as a child. Scotty, now a practicing amateur psychologist, believes her dream is only a repressed memory. He thinks he can solve her problem by taking her to the scene of her nightmare. They go to the San Juan Batista mission, and they kiss some more. They confess their love for each other. Madeline tells Scotty that she's in love with him. Scotty confesses his love. But Madeline understands something that Scotty doesn't. Madeline runs to the church tower. Scotty chases after her. On the stairs, Scotty panics because of his phobia. Through a window, he sees Madeline fall screaming to her death. Scotty feels everything has gone horribly wrong and runs away. At the coroner's inquest, Scotty is severely chastised for being weak and making bad decisions. However, he is not held responsible for Madeline's death, and Madeline's death is ruled a suicide. The accumulated stress results in a nervous breakdown. He spends a year in a mental hospital. Scotty cannot forget Madeline. He goes to the places where he used to see her, as many broken-hearted lovers do. He imagines he sees her but it is not her. In downtown San Francisco at a florist shop where Madeline purchased the bouquet, 
he runs into Judy. He follows her. Except for her hair, clothing, and voice, she is the exact image of Madeline. Scotty is aggressive, pushy, and full of questions. She puts up some resistance, but lets him into her room. She convinces him she is not who he thinks she is. She recognizes that he has lost someone and expresses sympathy. Scotty makes a dinner date and then leaves. The memory of Gavin murdering his wife flashes in her mind. We now know that Scotty did recognize Madeline, but Judy has successfully lied to him again. She gets a suitcase and starts packing, knowing it's only a matter of time. She sits down and writes a confession letter to Scotty. It was all an elaborate plan so Gavin could murder his wife. She confesses she still loves him and wants him to love her. She then has second thoughts. Maybe she should take a chance on love. She tears up the letter and goes to dinner with Scotty. Scotty and Judy begin dating full time. He wants to buy her a dress. Judy gets upset because he wants her to look like Madeline. Judy allows Scotty to transform her into Madeline. She wants him to love her for who she is, but will accept being loved pretending to be someone else. Everything is wonderful. They're in love. Then Judy does something extremely foolish. She puts on a piece of jewelry that is an exact copy of what Carlotta wore in the painting. It is also a piece of evidence linking her to first-degree murder. It is too obvious even for Scotty to ignore. He now realizes that Judy and Madeline are the same person. Scotty takes Judy back to the San Juan Batista Tower, he is so angry he forgets his fear of heights. He insists Judy confess. She does, and she also confesses her love for him. This touches Scotty, and it looks like they may reconcile. But Judy is startled by the shadow of a nun and falls out the window to her death. Both Scotty and Judy are tragically flawed characters. They both exhibit predatory natures, and yet they are presented as sympathetic victims of a dark fate. This is the nature of the delusional ego. It is the architect of its own suffering, yet it sees and represents itself as a victim.